So any any questions before uh, today's a crazy class? Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about something called probabilistically checkable proofs. Uh, at some level, the whole like last month has been sort of leading up to this. This is, I think, one of the more deeper results related to randomized algorithms. It's an interesting comment about both computation and MP hardness and stuff like that and randomization and the role of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there's just a lot going on. Uh, this is a lecture that we won't finish in this class. It'll almost, it'll certainly go on to next class. I mean, I certainly haven't finished the slides to do the whole thing. It takes a long time, which makes me a little anxious, but usually if I don't finish making all the slides, that means we probably have too much for one class and it kind of works itself out. Um, okay, so, all right, so probabilistically checkable proof. So, all right, so even back in lecture one, when we talked about 3SAT and approximating it, I briefly mentioned that you actually can't do better than uh, that 7 8 approximation. And to some extent, that's what we're going to prove today, although we won't get anywhere near the tight 7 8 bound, but still we'll start talking about how to get hardness of approximation. Right? And, uh, okay. As far as the kind of uh, techniques we're going to be discussing, uh, we're going to do a lot of stuff related to some of this this random walks we've been working with. Um, you know, uh, themes related to expander graphs and and zigzag products and and stuff like that. Uh, although I think maybe the the application here will be a little more creative because it, it it doesn't feel like we're doing a graph problem initially. But I'll, we'll see when I get there. Okay. But let me just at least recap what we did last time, just to remind us. So I think we're we're talking a little bit about some of these randomized complexity classes, like uh, randomized polynomial time. That's one-sided error. BPP. That's two-sided error. And last class, we're just interested in this kind of basic question of okay, uh, let's say one-sided error. I have probability of error one half. I want to get that error probability down to one in a thousand or something. And so we would just uh, repeat log of 1,000 times and I'll put the or of all those answers normally, right? And the question was, okay, so whatever. Uh, as far as the number of random bits goes, you know, every time you sample a brand new set of bits, that's the price you pay. And okay, at some level, that's pretty satisfactory. We never cared to question it before. It's simple and usually the log factor doesn't matter too much. Still, you might ask if you can do better. And that's what we explored. So uh, instead of doing like completely independent repetitions to do your amplification, uh, there's other ways to go about it. So that instead of like multiplying by a log one over delta factor, like you would with repetition, you only have to pay log one over delta additional random bits. So it's m plus log one over delta as opposed to m times log one over delta. So you can actually do something more economic than independent repetitions and and the idea was was to sort of take advantage of of the behavior of random walks on expanders so there what we did was sort of for every possible bit string random bit string that gets fed into your randomized algorithm we made a vertex and we kind of threw an expander on top okay and our algorithm was something like so to simulate you know a hundred independent samples but we won't quite make it independent we would randomly sample one vertex out of this graph and then we do a random walk for 100 steps and in those vertices we visit are used as the random bits okay so uh you know the immediate trade-off is that okay i need m bits to pick my first vertex and then only a constant number of bits to choose each subsequent vertex uh, each for each yeah each subsequent vertex for each subsequent step so that's why you get m plus really the number of steps, which is log of one over delta. Uh, and the high level intuition is that if you're an expander graph, a random walk approaches the stationary distribution really fast. And in a constant degree expander, the stationary distribution is uniform. So if you randomly walk around for a modest amount of time, it really starts to look and behave like you're independently sampling from the graph. There's of course some difference. You're not actually independently sampling from the graph, 
that difference is quantitatively captured by a spectral gap and it shows up in the analysis, right? We get some dependency on a spectral gap, but intuitively that's what's going on. So, so in this way, we kind of can simulate independent sampling by random walk in an expander, which is not independent, right? As, as it was pointed out last time, if you had a vertex, you only have, you know, 10 possible neighbors, right? You are quite constricted. It's not at all completely random. However, somehow this graph structure is it, just so well connected. The conductance is high and all these things that, that even though it's locally a sparse graph, it kind of globally acts like a complex, well-connected graph. Okay. All right, so today, today we're just going to be talking about these uh, probabilistically checkable proofs. It, it's quite a long proof. It's a, it's a longer and more elaborate proof than anything we've done so far. So we're not going to try to do the whole thing today. And at least based on my preparation, I think a lot of our discussion today is almost on the conceptual side, what is a probabilistically checkable proofs, how to start getting the proof going, and we only get partway through. But I think most of the heavy lifting will be done after Thanksgiving break, from what I can tell. So hopefully we can at least even wrap our mind around what's a probabilistically checkable proofs, what's this theorem stating. I mean, it's a lot of interesting conceptual stuff going on, and try to get some of the moving pieces in place, and hopefully we'll be in good enough shape that we can just kind of knock it out uh, when we come back on Tuesday. I'll I'll do a recap at the beginning of this class to refresh this, and then hopefully, yeah. In fact, it's so long that several parts of the proof are probably going to be set aside as exercises for the last homework as well. But there will be lots of hints, and yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so. All right, so we'll start with some complexity terms. All right, so as we know, uh, language L is in polynomial time if there's some deterministic polynomial time decision algorithm for that language L. So you have some input x and you decide, oh, it's in the language, it's not in the language, okay, fine. All right, MP. First of all, anyone know what MP stands for? Okay, yeah, so it does not stand for not polynomial time. It stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, why is it called non-deterministic polynomial time? Yeah, okay, so how would you describe a non-deterministic term machine? Yeah, so these are like uh, ridiculous computers where every step you can, uh, you, instead of like doing this or doing that, you just like split the universe in two and you do both in parallel, both in parallel, both in parallel. So these are roughly problems that you can brute force because it's like, oh, what's the first bit, zero or one? I don't know, but I can parallelly, non-deterministically split, split, split. So in polynomial time, you can kind of get out all the possible bit strings, just one bit per step. And then it takes polynomial time to verify any one of these. And, okay, so I guess, but yeah, so that's a, a ridiculous definition. I mean, maybe the more concrete one, right, is you have some kind of, it's, it's all the problems where, not that you can find a solution in polynomial time, but you can double check a solution in polynomial time. So if you want to know if X is an L, Right, and we know things like sat. It's very hard to figure out if this formula is satisfiable that would correspond to x and l. But you do know that if it is satisfiable, you can prove it with a satisfying assignment, right? If you gave me the satisfying assignment, okay, I just double check and that's very easy. So that's those are the class of NP problems. So there's some kind of polynomial time algorithm that takes as input x, that thing that you're trying to decide on, as well as some kind of quote unquote proof or certificate. The size of this proof or certificate should be, you know, polynomial in the original x, okay? And the rules are uh, this algorithm that takes as input x and y. If x is in the language, if if the formula is satisfiable, then you should always be in. Uh, you should answer yes for some proof. There is some proof out there that will make your algorithm say accept x and say x is in the language, okay? If X is not in the language, if the formula is not satisfiable, no matter the proof, you should always be outputting that it's not satisfiable. Right? Makes sense. Okay. All right. So that's uh, P and MP. Okay. All right. So here's something sort of new. Okay. So we'll talk about the class of problems with quote unquote probabilistically checkable proofs with r random bits and q queries okay 
So as you might guess, this already seems more complicated than the previous definitions, since it has parameters. Okay, so first of all, we're going to be working in an Oracle model. So you'll have an X and a Y, right? You want to know if X is in the language and you have your proof Y, but we're going to be kind of doing sublinear stuff. So we're going to assume we have Oracle access to Y. So what the verifier can do is it can decide, oh, I want bits 5, 10, and 11 or something. And the Oracle will say, oh, bit 5 is 0, bit 10 is, is 1, and bit 11 is 12 or something. Okay. So we're going to be looking at verifiers that are actually going to, in principle, not necessarily look at the entire proof. In fact, they're going to try to randomly sample the proof in a smart way. Okay. So, okay. So the verifier is, uh, is, uh, is given, you know, the thing X, you want to decide if X is in the language or not. And Oracle access to Y. Okay. And it's going to proceed in three steps. The only real reason why it's broken in three steps is because we're talking about the non-adaptive ones. So it's sort of set up to be non-adaptive. Um, okay. So step one, the verifier is going to look at X and maybe flip, you know, up to R random bits. And it's going to decide which bits to query in the proof. Okay. It should be something like Q. Okay. It's non-adaptive. So in this one, you, you have to kind of decide your queries ahead of time. And then you get all the query answers at once. Adaptive would be like, oh, you query a bit, get the answer, then you choose your next query and not. But we're doing a non-adaptive one here, which is slightly more strict. Okay, that's not really too important of a distinction. Okay, so after you decide where to query, then you make the queries to Oracle, you find out the bits, and then you get to process the, the bits. You look at the bits you got back, you look at X, you look at your random bits you had originally flipped, and do you decide whether or not you're going to say that X is in the language? And the rules are, if X is in the language, you should always accept X. Okay. And if X is not in the language, you should be accepting it only with constant probability. Okay, one half is somewhat arbitrary. Okay, so you should be right most of the time in the negated case. You should always be right in the positive case. So something is like... Uh, you know, if, if it was sat, for example, you have a formula, that's your x, and then the proof would be like a satisfying assignment or something. And then maybe you would do something like, oh, I'll just check a couple random clauses, and if they're all right, then I'll say it's in the thing. Okay, that would at least follow the PCP protocol. Okay, or like if you're grading homework, right? So, uh, you know, you get some crazy thing, and you're like, okay, I'm just going to look for these three things in the homework. So they do this, they do that, do this. You know, there's a couple other crazy sentences I won't pay attention, and I'll arbitrarily decide their score, right? Okay, so PCP will also give you a way to grade your algorithms homework much faster and be right most of the time, but there's regrade requests. Okay, so, all right. So that's a general PCP kind of model, and, and potentially R and Q can be very small, right? So we're going to be really interested when Q, I mean, if Q was all of N or poly N, that's not very interesting. You can look at the whole proof. So we're going to be interested in like Q is like poly log N, right? So now I'm saying, look, if you only get a few queries to a proof, okay, is there anything clever you can do? You know, in other words, okay, take something like SAT or something, right? Uh, a classic MP hard problem. Is there some clever, I mean, can I come up with some kind of like sublinear verifier? The proof might be different. You can change sort of the proof that you ask for, right? There just has to exist some kind of why. But can you come up with some kind of system where, you know, you, you ex expect a, a proof why in the system, but you only have to then check logarithmically many bits. You don't have to look at the whole proof. Can I design a homework assignment where I don't have to look at the entire student solution to know that they roughly were correct? Or something like that, right? So uh, uh, it's a very interesting question, and for Q being, you know, polylogarithmic, it seems like quite a lot to ask for, right? Can you somehow uh, build a system where, in fact, you don't have to look at the whole thing to feel good about it? So, at some level, that suggests that for that to be true. There must be some kind of robustness built into Y, right? Some kind of, 
redundancy, right? Because you're only going to look at logarithmically many bits and it should give you a lot more global structure and, and stuff like that. Okay, so um, yeah, it's a lot to ask for. Any questions or thoughts about uh, at this stage? Well, so, oh, um, what's what's a proof why? Okay, so uh, are you okay with a proof why in the context of NP problems? Okay, so I mean it's the same role. We get to design the format of the proof. So usually with NP hard problems like we do like three sat or something, it's quite obvious the proof is a satisfying assignment. But maybe we can come up with something more clever or something, right? But really, you know, what we're saying is that if if x is an L, then there should be, oh, there should exist some y so that we always accept x. I, I should have wrote there exists y so that we always accept x. And I should have wrote that if x is not in the language, so it should be no, like an unsatisfiable formula, then for all y, we should only be able to accept x as probability at most one half. So similar to the role played by MP. But in principle, you're allowed to sort of design the proof however you want. I mean, ask for a certain kind of proofs. But if there exists a proof that makes it always accept and, and stuff like that. So we have some control over the design of, of the proofs we ask for. Okay. Uh, well, so it depends on Q. But we're going to choose Q to be much smaller than the size of Y. So you can choose any bit you want. You can access any bit you want. But the, what makes the problem fun and interesting and challenging is can you, can you feel pretty good about accepting or not accepting X without looking at the whole proof? Oh, so the verifier takes as input x and y. So the verifier is given x and y. So it's the same thing with NP, right? So with NP, the, the verifier is given x and y. And all we know is that if x is in the language, there exists some y out there. That doesn't mean we check all y's. We just, I mean, that's just a definition of the class of problems. So a language is in this PCP QR if there exists a verifier that works like this using Q queries and R random bits. Yeah. So there's a model in the main vertex where it's writing this. Sure. Okay. Let I me. Mean... There freeze? Oh, no. Okay. All right. So let's see. Let me draw some pictures. First, uh, let me add one thing. This should have been for all, uh, for some y. And this should have been for all y. Okay, so just to be clear, we're looking at a black box. Let me draw a black box. Okay. Here's the black box. All right. This is the verifier. And it takes as input x and y in the case of NP as well, right? And based on that, it answers yes or no. And the rules are if x is in the language, then there's some y that should make the verifier say yes for NP, right? Okay, so out, out comes either yes, x is an L. No, x is not a no. Okay, so that's the, the high level format. Okay, so uh, so for NP, a language is an NP if there's some box like this that takes polynomial time, and the rules are if x is in the language, there's some y that'll make the black box answer yes. And if, if x is not in the language, then for any y, you should always answer no. So that's the definition of NP. Uh, an example is SAT formulas. So I want to know if this formula is satisfiable. So X is this formula. L is the, is the family of satisfiable assignments, uh, satisfiable formulas. 
And so the proof would probably be an assignment, right? You say, okay, the, give me an assignment and I'll just check to see if it satisfies the formula. If so, I'll answer yes. If not, I'll answer no. So if the formula is not satisfiable, then no matter what why you give me, you're not gonna convince me that the formula is satisfiable because I'm just gonna check and then find something that's wrong. But if the formula is satisfiable, you could give me a satisfying assignment that convinces me, the verifier, the black box, that the formula is satisfiable. So now in the context of PCP, okay, so any language that has a black box following this format is, is in the class MP. So for PCP, we're again saying like, oh, any language that has a black box following this format in the top right is in the class PCP for this parameter R and Q. So now this black box has slightly different rules. The input and output are the same. So the black box still takes an input X and Y, although Y is kind of more of an Oracle axis, and it'll still answer yes or no, okay? But the rules are, it can only use R random bits if it's in PCP RQ, and it's only allowed to look at Q bits of the proof. So it's not allowed to look at the whole proof. So it's sort of weaker in some ways than the MP Right, because it's sort of you're you're tying its hands behind its back and saying, okay, you can only look at a few bits of the proof, and you still need to to say with some confidence yes or no. Yeah. What does Y indicate? Yeah. So Y is still acting as some kind of proof, okay? But uh, here, for this to work. Somehow Y probably needs to be very clever and kind of compact or something so that just a few bits would suffice. Yeah, so this wouldn't quite work, but something that would follow at least the protocol is this. So uh, L is the language of satisfiable formulas. So X describes a formula. And let's say that Y is, 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 uh, will have the format of an assignment just like before, an assignment of the variables. And maybe you would take your formula and the Y, and instead of looking at everything, you would just check like one or two clauses of the formula and check to see if they're satisfied, right? And then you'd only have to look at a few variables from, the, from Y to check those two clauses. So you're only looking at a limited part and you're gonna say yes or no, depending on it. And you know, all you're really saying is, oh, I randomly sampled a few clauses, it looked okay to me. Okay, now if, if the formula was satisfiable and why was that satisfying assignment, you'll always answer yes. So there does exist a Y that makes sure you always answer yes. Now if X is not in L, so it's not satisfiable, well, our, our, that particular protocol probably wouldn't work because out of M clauses, there's one wrong. So if you sample it randomly, then okay, you'll figure out that it's not satisfiable. But most of the time, if you're only sampling two clauses or something, you won't get the bad clause. You'll get like two satisfied clauses and then you'll think it's satisfied because you missed the, the one mistake. Okay, so that's also why it's sort of non-trivial is that it's, uh, yeah, this gap kind of thing, right? Um, right, right. In fact, so what we'll kind of be doing, you know, so, the other statement, right, is that we already know, or I've already stated, is that it's MP hard to figure out if a formula is satisfiable or if it's 7 8 unsatisfiable or 7 8 satisfiable, right? It's MP, it's MP hard to figure out if you can satisfy more than 7 8 plus epsilon, 7 8 plus 0.01% of the thing. But why, why does that kind of tie into the conversation we just had? If I kind of want to roughly figure out if it's 7 8 satisfiable, right, then actually I only need a sample a fair number of clauses to roughly figure out the expect, you know, what's roughly the fractional amount of clauses that's being satisfied, right? You know, if we do log n over epsilon squared or something, then we'll figure out plus or minus epsilon. Or actually, you know, you just do one over epsilon squared or something, you apply turn off, then we'll figure out roughly up to plus or minus epsilon what fraction of the clauses are being satisfied. If I'm, okay, let me take a step back. You have a big three sat formula. And I only want to query a few clauses and try to figure out if it's seven eight satisfiable or not, right? So if you if you or roughly, you know, plus or minus some epsilon, so you, there's some margin of error you're allowed, right? 
But if you if you sample like one over epsilon squared or some constant over epsilon squared, and and let's say that an alpha fraction of let's say yeah you know if if it's like 0.5 fraction of the things are actually satisfied, then you'll figure out like oh it's either 0.5 plus epsilon or 0.5 minus epsilon are actually satisfied and that's below seven eighths and you can actually decide some of these things. All right, so actually seven eighths and stuff like that where you have this gap is a little bit easier to do a probabilistic sampling kind of thing. It gets really hard though when it comes to exact solve satisfying sat and inexact satisfying exactly solving a sat formula because you, there's only one clause out there or something and it's hard to sample that one clause. Okay, so at some level this is why the PCP theorem coming up is going to tie into this also hardness of approximation and trying to understand why it's hard to do better than seven eighths and stuff like that. I mean that's part of the connection implicitly. Okay. Other questions? It's sort of a, yeah. Um, so, are your queries like the same for every single y? Or like... Well, okay, so you make the queries, you don't look at y before you make the queries, but you do have r random bits. So, in the case of sampling formula uh, clauses to check in a SAF formula, you can maybe, yeah, randomly sample some bits and choose which, which formulas you want to. So, you're taking the same approach for every y that comes in, but also each instance, you know, there's some chance of this and that. So, like, the, the x's went out, that means, like, there's some y that no matter which random Yeah. Yeah, so you should always be answering yes, and then if x is not in L, then sometimes you should say no. So at some level, you're kind of sampling and looking for a mistake, hoping to find a mistake. If you don't find a mistake, you kind of say yes. It seems like, in intuitively. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, sure, sure, sure. So why take a big picture? Okay, so I would say that's almost small picture, right? So in, in literal terms, if I'm actually writing an algorithm to verify this and verify that, and I'm not worried about polynomial time, then there's no need for this. I think if you take an even bigger picture and you look philosophically, the idea of having proofs, right? I mean, just in general, being able to prove things in some kind of very redundant or robust way so that you only have to inspect a minuscule amount of the proof to know with some confidence whether it's correct or not. That's a very strong idea, right? Like you were just reviewing some papers for a conference today, right? So uh, if you knew kind of what to look for and you can select, right, what to look for, then you wouldn't have to read every sentence, right? So, um, uh, but, uh, and so it's also a comment about redundancy and whether you can also do redundancy efficiently and stuff like that. Um, there is some connection to, you know, error correcting codes and stuff like that. So if you, if you take, for example, the statement that doing harder than seven, a seven eighth, doing better than seven eighth approximation is MP hard, right? It's sort of saying that getting better than seven eighth approximation on SAT is just as hard and just as good as solving SAT altogether, right? So there's some error tolerance of like one over eight, right? That's essentially insignificant uh, conceptually. If you think about maybe what error correcting codes do, right, is that they can tolerate, you can take a message and you can screw up some of the bits, a constant fraction of bits, and try to recover the exact underlying message exactly. So when we say that 7 8 plus epsilon sat is empty hard, I'm saying that if I can. If I can satisfy more than seven eighths of the clauses of an arbitrary formula in polynomial time, then I can solve any SAT formula exactly in polynomial time. Okay, so it's a, if I can do a, a better than random algorithm for SAT, but otherwise makes mistakes, an imperfect algorithm, I can get a perfect algorithm, something that gets perfect solutions. Because that's what MP hard means, right? Because the reductions. And if, if in fact, if you, you know, open up some of the constructions, what they would kind of do is you take a SAT formula and you build another SAT formula, but you try to add some redundancy, 
right? So that you kind of can't violate, like, so that making one mistake kind of expands out to making many mistakes after kind of building out several layers of SAP formulas where you add more and more redundancy uh, overall. Okay, so that sort of that one error blows up to, okay. But on the flip side, because everything's like a polynomial time reduction and stuff like that, you want to keep things efficient. So if you start with this formula that you want to try to figure out if it can be solved exactly, and you start building, you know, transforming it into more formulas that have more redundancy, you want to keep the size pretty similar, right? Because you can't make it exponentially bigger or something because a polynomial time algorithm on an exponentially bigger thing is not a polynomial time on the original thing, right? So you have to do it in a shrewd, kind of clever way a sparse way and stuff like that. That's sort of similar in spirit to what error correcting codes want to do. They want to add redundancy, but they want to have pretty minimal overhead. So in fact, roughly at the same time of the PCP theorem, there is a parallel line of work building out something called expander codes, which is in fact very efficient, theoretically efficient error correcting codes using expander graphs of sort of uh, implicitly, say, you know, uh, because a uh, sum of expander graphs are these objects that have a lot of connections and sort of robustness and, and stuff, but are also very small objects because they're constant degree. So, yeah, so there's this this idea of kind of having robustness, but with only like constant overhead, you know, not blowing up the size of things. That's very important. And and so I think, you know, I'm, this is not really my area, so I'm, I'm only kind of speaking uh a little bit intuitively and in how I, I interpret some of these things. Uh, but it's also the starting point for a lot of hardness and approximation results. So 7 8 plus epsilon is one, but there's all sorts of, because you can do like hardness preserving reductions, so to speak, from one problem to another. Oh, if you get this approximation factor here, then you can get that approximation factor there, and then you get that over there, and you know we can't do that or something, right? So just like other stuff. Uh, and that's also very consequential. That's very useful, right? Um, because uh, approximations is how we go about problems that we can't solve exactly. To find out that we have limits there also is a real pain, but a very profound uh, thing. Um, yeah, I was saying. So, uh, yeah, so at some level, this leads to sort of a more quantitatively robust version of the theory of MP hardness, one that can tolerate things like approximations and stuff, which you know, these numbers come into play and it's like it's a little bit more complicated, but, but it's, whereas the MP hard can only do very qualitative yes or no kind of things. Now we can do a little bit more grayscale um, with the approximations and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so these are all kind of big, they, they touch on a lot of different things. I can only, but even you, you'll see, for example, the ideas that show up here are not disconnected from the ideas to do log space connectivity a couple of classes ago, not disconnected to ideas to try to reduce randomization last class and stuff. So there's lots of like interesting um, connections too. And they, they're all very strongly related to each other. You know, not one does not necessarily have complete priority over the others. Okay, good questions. Any others? Yeah. All right, let's find out. Okay, here we go then. I think we appreciate the complexity of this. So, yes, this for any Q&R, you have an interesting class. But here's now the, the big clean theorem, is that MP is equal to using constant number of random bits and querying log n spots. So maybe you could do less than log n, but log n is pretty small. And it turns out that captures NP uh, completely. Okay, so nice big clean theorem at some level. Of course, there's a lot compressed in the acronyms, but, but now it looks nice, okay? All right, so, uh, and again, I think it's like a, an important consequence that I think about, or like helps me frame it is, is that it eventually leads to, you know, getting a 7, 8 plus epsilon approximation. It immediately leads to like some weak constant approximation, proving any constant at all was kind of exciting, and then you need, you know, it takes more effort to get the sharp bound of seven eighth. But uh, but I always think this is a nice, clean, we understand three sat, we know how to get seven eighth really simply. And in fact, it's so easy to get seven eighth. I think it's so surprising to know that you can't do anything better than randomly flipping coins on this thing, right? 
and it's sort of a downer. All right, yeah. So how exactly? Oh, uh, okay, so we will roughly show for something similar to 3SAT some constant. And then, so in other words, uh, like getting 99% uh, SAT is hard or something, right? So, which is much better than 7 eighth. And then you have to somehow, yeah, add the redundancy so that getting 7 eighth is just as good as getting 99% of the clauses. And we'll have roughly shown, skipping some steps, that getting 99% is as good as solving the, the, the formula exactly. Uh, so these uh, techniques, uh, uh, I think they have to use some Fourier analytic techniques. Uh, but again, it's not, it's similar in some level to also what expander codes are trying to do and, and various things. Because you want to argue that that doing better than seven eighths is just is roughly the same as getting ninety nine percent. So you you take your ninety nine percent problem and you kind of build a a, ro a a kind of a more robust and layered SAT formula. So that getting seven eighths here will let you get ninety nine percent up here. Uh, but you have to start getting really shrewd to get the tight bounds. And okay, I haven't really read the paper. Okay, all right. But I might over Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> okay. We'll see. Um, it is important. It's on the list. Okay. So there's two directions, and, and this direction is actually a little bit easier. Okay. So the claim is that anything that only needs log n queries and a constant number of bits is an NP. Okay. So you have some black box that's sort of in some proof system. Where you only have to make a limited number of queries, and you can decide with, say, confidence one half that uh, x is not an L if that's the case. How does that lead to a deterministic polynomial time verifier? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's say you're flipping, I don't know, 10 coins. So it flips 10 coins and then it chooses some locations and it, it does stuff, right? So at some level, you can uh, make a deterministic algorithm that will enumerate all 10 bits, uh, 10 bit strings, right? And then so for one of those uh, all tails, for example, on the first one, that's some, once you flip the bits, the rest is deterministic, right? So that looks at a few bits of the proof and it makes a decision. And then so then the next coin tosses, next coin tosses. So you can enumerate all of them, run all of them. That's a deterministic thing, right? And then and then what? Yeah, and then take a majority vote because that, that algorithm should have been right at least half the time so the majority vote will, will get you. Oh, no, no, it's, it's not a majority vote. Yeah, so, so so we're not actually going to do a majority vote. We're going to do something similar, though. But maybe someone could fill in. Yeah. So okay. So I, I've I've run uh, you know two to the ten of these things. I've enumerated all the ten bit strings, and I have a bunch of yeses and nos. Now what do I do? Yeah, sure, sure. So you have all the quantity at your disposal, right? So you've, you've just simulated, enumerated everything. So you know which ones are yes and which ones are no. You know what fraction, but what do I output and why? At the end of the day, I have to output one yes or one no, right? Right now you have, you know, 100 yeses, 100 noes or something, right? So how do you decide? If there's a no, then you definitely have a no. Okay, so at some level, okay, maybe I could zoom in here. Okay, so there's some kind of uh, one-sided error, right? So yeah, if there's any, 
Okay, so if X is an L, they, they all have to be yeses. And if there's a single no, then it had to be in the X is not an L, right? And it was probably one half, you'll get a no. So you'll get at least one no. There should be at least half of them are no's. Um, but anyway, but if maybe it was a smaller constant or something, it doesn't matter. But yeah, so you can take the, not the or, but like the ors of the nots, so to speak. But roughly, you just look for one no. You don't have to do a majority. Okay. All right, so yeah, so it's it's so few queries, so few random bits that you can easily de-randomize in the laziest possible way. That's the main main takeaway. Okay, good, and that also makes sure we roughly know the definitions. All right, so now the hard direction is um is to take a, a problem in NP, NP hard problem, and uh, make a PCP out of it. All right. Okay, good. All right, so let me give you uh, just first an example, and then it'll, it'll be get, a bit more abstract in a moment. But but three colorability is just a, a basic problem where you know you have a graph, you want to color the vertices one of three colors so that no edge is monochromatic. No edge has both endpoints have the same color, right? So I I want to think of that as like a constraint satisfaction problem. That definition is coming up next. But at some level, each vertex is like a, a variable taking one of three possibilities. And each edge represents a constraint saying, okay, the, the endpoints have to be different colors. Okay, but in general, you know, it, there could be more interesting logic besides, oh, they have to be different colors or something. Okay, there could be any amount of logic kind of built into one of these constraints. It'll still be a constant because there's only a constant number of possibilities. Okay, so that's sort of, uh, so it's so a more generally kind of a QRE constraint satisfaction problem. So you have some variables and you have an alphabet, okay? And in general, you're going to assign every variable some letter from your alphabet. So it could be red, blue, green. It could be one, two, three, four, five, whatever. It could be true or false if it's just a two-letter alphabet. And a clause is going to be defined by uh, Q variables that are participating in it. Uh, vertex one or variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four, and the subset of, of assignments of letters that you're willing to take. So generally just some set of saying, oh, these letters, they're okay. Oh, those letters, they're not okay for those variables. Okay. So again, for three colorability, then the variables are the vertices, the alphabets, the colors. And for every edge, you have a constraint, which is all the combinations of colors where one is different from the other. Okay, so that should be like, uh, how many is that? That's like three squared minus three or something. So there's like six combinations that are okay, I think. Okay, so yeah, there'll be a set of six, right? So, And that's a special case where every edge has the exact same constraint. That doesn't have to be the case in general. Okay. All right, so we're gonna be looking at QRA constraint satisfaction problems. That's of course kind of, Generalization of SAD, generalization of three colorings, so forth. So it's clearly MP hard. Okay. Uh, so one thing we're going to be paying a lot of attention to is is given some constraint satisfaction problems, so CSP. What is sort of the the minimum fraction of unsatisfied clauses you can get? Okay. So unsat P will always be a value between zero and one because it represents a fraction. Okay. Zero means it can be satisfied. There's some way to unsatisfy zero of them. Okay. Because in general, we're going to try to take like a small number, ramp it up to a big one or a bigger one. Okay. So, so we'll be using this unsat notation a lot. Okay. So the theorem we're going to try to prove. Okay. I'm not 100% sure if we're going to get a constant of one half, but it's not too important. Okay, there's some kind of integers Q and an alphabet size A, so some constants out there. So that if you're looking at a QRE CSP over alphabet of that size A, okay, it's empty hard to decide if it can be completely satisfied or if, if unsat P is greater than one half. Okay, so we're gonna try to show that it's empty hard to figure out between perfect and half wrong. Big gap. That means if it's in the middle, you can output anything you want. All right. 
Okay, so that's that's how that's the direct thing we're going to try to prove. Uh, well, we could discuss this a little bit. It's left as an exercise, but I don't see why we can't talk um, out loud about it at a high level. The claim is, okay, this on one hand is just this NP equals PCP, and in particular, we want to show that NP is a subset of PCP at this point. On the other hand, there's this thing that, okay, it's hard to figure out one half versus nothing. Okay. All right, so does anyone want to speculate as to why they might be equivalent or try to connect the two? Yeah, okay, okay. So that's MP hard. So, okay, we can always reduce to the problem on the right. Okay. So now the question is okay, so the, basically to show that MP is a subset of PCP, uh, so assuming this theorem, if I can come up with a PCP for that problem, that shows that MP is a subset of PCP for one log n. Right? Okay, so what would be a PCP for this? Yeah, yeah. So if half the clauses are unsatisfied, right, then then at some level, um, uh, if I if I query a few, you know, you have a good chance of hitting one of the unsatisfied ones, and then you output okay, it wasn't a satisfiable formula. And if it was completely satisfied, you query a few, and you always conclude satisfied. Okay. So the point is that once you have this big gap like one half, it's not so tough to come up with a PCP because now you can sample. And you just figure out if it's like mostly wrong or completely right. And you can figure that out by sampling a few clauses. Okay. Um, all right. I wonder if I got that backwards. Should it be log n bits and one constant number of queries? It's quite possible it should be backwards. I think it should be flipped because you need log n bits to choose one of these clauses. Uh, Okay, well, I'll, I'll correct the proofs next time if that's the case. That's, not, of course, moderately important. I think it should be log n random bits just so you can choose indices in the proof and in a constant number of queries. Okay, but, but at this stage, we won't quite, yeah. They should both be small is really the point. Okay. Um, good, good. Uh, in the opposite direction, you'll need to show that if the PCP theorem was true, then that problem should be MP hard. All right. Um, okay. That means that you take some language, a generic language in NP, you assume there exists a PCP, and you'll want to build uh, one of these. Uh, constraint satisfaction problems where deciding between zero and one half uh, will let you figure out the solution to the original one. Okay, so take the existence of a, of a PCP and you have to build an appropriate constraint satisfaction problem. Okay, so I'll leave that. Okay, good. All right, we're going at a nice casual pace. It's fine. We're just having fun at this point. Okay, all right, so um, so most of the time we're gonna be discussing a limited class of constraint satisfaction problems that does look a lot like graph coloring, okay? So we're gonna be focusing on two area CSPs, so there's only two variables for every constraint, and the variables will can be th thought of as vertices, and every edge in the graph will correspond to some constraint in the CSP. I'll point out that you know there could be many constraints over the same two variables, so there will generally be parallel edges, and those edges will sort of be annotated with different constraints. Okay, so at some level in the future, I'm going to be kind of identifying edges with the constraints over the two variables, but it's not just defined by the endpoints. There's also some annotation of 
what the, the logic of the constraint is over those two variables. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so initially given a problem, a graph CSP problem G, so that includes three coloring, so that's also, you know, MP hard. Okay, uh, claim is that it's MP hard to figure out if unsat G is equal to zero or if unsat G is greater than or equal to one over M where M is the number of edges slash clauses. Why? I think so, but mm, may I phrase it differently. Uh, So, okay, well, how about this? Why does, so there's a gap here, right? It's one over M versus zero. Why is this gap equivalent to solving the yes or no question of this graph CSP is satisfiable at all? So the claim is that if I can solve it with this gap, one over M, then I can solve uh, in general a graph CSP where I just want to know satisfiable or not. Clauses, yeah. Yeah, so this is the minimum error. This is just one thing being wrong. So of course, if you can figure out if at least one thing is wrong, you can, yeah, that's right. Okay, so there's nothing too big a deal there. So this we just start, this is our starting point, right? We already know this is MP hard, but it's sort of put into a language that looks like what we eventually want to prove. So our goal then is to somehow take this one over M and try to ramp it up to a constant. Okay, so we're going to start with one instance of graph CSP and somehow build a more and more complicated instances of graph CSP, although we do have to be mindful about the size. What starts at a polynomial needs to stay at a polynomial, okay? But somehow build some redundancy or something, a more complicated involved graph CSP, where suddenly figuring out if the unsat is bigger than one third or something is as good as figuring out if the original unsat was zero. Okay. All right. Okay, so very much in the spirit of, of the last two lectures, we're going to be taking, you know, instances of graph CSP. I'm going to assume they're regular with a fixed degree. Okay, and you can pre-process your first one to get fixed degrees, not a big deal. Okay, and we're going to apply some, some graph transformations. They're not exactly graph transformations anymore because we're really morphing graph CSP problems. So we will build a new graph, but we also have to figure out what to do about the constraints and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more involved than we used to do. And so we're going to be transforming a graph CSPs sort of one at a time and somehow try to, you know, change the graph one way, change the graph another way, change the graph another way, and hope that at the end, the graphs are roughly the same size and the alphabet and all the other parameters are the same, except the unsat has gone up, say by a factor of two or something. So we're just trying to increase the unsat every time if, if it was originally unsatisfiable. If it was zero, then it won't ever change. Okay. All right, so these transformations are, number one, some kind of pre-processing step. So we take our graph CSP and we'll turn it into a constant degree expander. Okay, so, uh, I just want to make sure that the underlying graph is a, is a constant degree expander. Okay, so uh, and it turns out that both, the, yeah, having a good spectral gap and having constant degree is going to be very useful, particularly in the next two steps, which are a little bit more involved. The last step, I haven't even made the slides for yet. Okay, the next one is going to be powering. It's going to be called powering, but this is where it really raised the unsat. Okay, it's going to ramp up the unsat, and I'll explain that when we get there. Now, this is the most interesting part. This will take the most time. We'll only roughly do a little bit today and do most of it next time. But it's going to increase some other things. In this case, it's going to increase the alphabet size by a lot. Okay, and that has a certain, certain that creates some problems. So the third step 
is going to be called alphabet reduction, and it's going to try to reduce the size of the alphabet back to where you started. Okay, and then the hope is that you've increased unsat g so much here that even though these will kind of bring bring down unsat g a little bit, so you give up a little bit, but it should be offset by the increase here, um, and overall you should you should win. Okay. All right, so so those are the three high level steps, and then they're going to We'll have a table and we'll see all the parameters work out, you know, at the end of it. Okay, so okay, so the first step is uh, how to take a graph G and turn it into a constant degree expander. So the, the primary issue is uh, um, that the vertices are very high degree. Okay, and uh, let me just double check. Yeah, okay, that'll be fun. Okay, so okay, so what's what's the um all right, so what's the high level idea? So okay, let's see. Okay, so some level what we're gonna do is is let's say I have some vertex V which has tons of edges. I can't really draw a ton, but this is in principle a lot of edges, okay? And the first thing we're gonna do is at some level, I'm gonna sort of treat each edge as its own vertex, so to speak. So there's one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or something, okay? And so these are all, Kind of the edges are there, but this is like, if this was like E1 or something, this vertex will be labeled like V E1, so to speak. Okay, so I'm kind of blowing up every vertex, all right? Uh, so, and that's gonna happen on the other end too, you know, this will be some U E1, and there's some cloud of U from splitting up U into lots of pieces, okay? And, okay, and then, and so for each, uh, uh, edge, I'll, 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 in the original graph, I'll make the corresponding edge between the corresponding kind of auxiliary vertices I've introduced. Okay. All right. So now the only kind of thing I'm missing is that, you know, here's one vertex, right? So at some level, of course, the same, like this graph coloring, it's going to be the same color for all of these when it participates in all these constraints. The issue here is that I've kind of spread everything out. These vertices are kind of independent. This could be blue, that could be red, that could be green or something. Okay, so I want to force them to all be the same. How might I do that? Yeah, okay, so we can add equality constraints to all the things, right? So I can, I can like put a whole complete graph there. Now, okay, the one drawback is originally I had a high degree vertex. And my goal, my initial goal was splitting these things up and see right now I have all these one degree vertices. So that's good, I've had some kind of win. But if I add all the edges back in, then okay, I'm back to normal. I have the same degree as before in fact, okay? So how do I, instead of putting a complete graph, I want a sparse graph that acts like a complete graph. It's an expander, okay? So we have the existence of these sparse graphs that analytically behave like complete graphs. So you add some kind of sparse but strongly connected graph. I guess that's what the picture was supposed to represent. Okay, so this should be connected. I don't know, so okay. It's a little bit less than a complete graph. It's more dramatic if the degree was bigger and stuff, but. And, and you add a constraint saying, oh, these have to be the same, these have to be the same, these have to be the same, these have to be the same. So we get to define a constraint and that's a relatively simple one. Okay, so that's step three. Oops. Step three for every vertex, we add a constant degree expander over that cloud for that vertex and equality constraints in between them. Okay. All right. Okay, so. All right, so the claim, I'm actually missing one more thing which is important. All right, so, but we can go through the first three first. Okay, so the first claim is that 
okay, let's say that E prime is my new graph, right? Roughly the size of the graph is a number of edges. So we're just trying to make sure the number of edges doesn't go up too much. Okay, because one of my worries as I keep building out these graphs is that the thing gets way too big, way too fast, because I, I still want to show at the end of the day that solving a polynomial times thing on the last graph is polynomial time in the original input size, which means the last graph has to be pretty similar in size to the original. Okay, so the claim is that the number of edges has only gone up by a constant factor y. Yeah, we've only added really a constant degree expander. So for every vertex, I've added a few edges or something, and I can charge like these three edges to this one edge here or something. So it goes up by a constant. Okay, good. Uh, it's it's also regular because all of these these vertices consist of one original thing plus the constant thing. Actually, the graph I drew is not regular, but that's okay. Okay. Um, this is a little bit tougher. So. Okay, well, how about this one is maybe a little easier. The claim is that unsat g is at least unsat g prime. So the unsat can only go down. Why? Yeah, okay, so so let's say you had some assignment here that uh, had 0.1 error or something, right? And that can become an assignment in your bigger graph where you just, uh, for all the copies of the vertex, you give it the original label, right? And you'll still screw up 0.1 of the original edges, but you'll get all of these edges in the middle correct. So you actually get a free, you get some free points from the the extra edges you added, okay? Because you'll you'll give everyone the same assignment. The flip one is saying that unsat g should be some at most a uh, it can't go down too much, right? And so intuitively, what you kind of want to argue is that you basically want to or is not much advantage to giving um, vertices up there different labels. Like you can almost just look at it and be like, oh, let's say these two are different, right? And so you you lose one point because they have two different ones and it's an equality constraint. And you can always like flip this one to match that one. You lose this edge, but you get back this one. So it's a break even overall. And you can get back to one where everything is the same. And then you can relate it to unsat g at a high level. Okay. The last one is a little bit trickier. I have to think about it. But I'll make sure there's enough hints on the homework. Um, sorry, the last one is that the spectral gap of gamma, oh no, maybe that doesn't matter too much. Yeah, okay. Um, the other one, uh, this actually escapes me a little bit at the moment, is that uh, the spectral graph of gamma is at least some constant. Okay, I have to think a little bit about why, uh, but I'll do that offline. Okay, but this is important. So when we go into the next step, all we really need to know is that we didn't lose too much on the unsat. You know, we, we, we prefer not to lose anything because we're trying to put unsat up, but you lose, okay, a constant. We'll try to make up for that the next step. But it is important that we have a constant spectral gap after this, the size didn't go up by too much, and that we have a regular graph. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, good. All right, so that, that addresses the first step. And now here comes uh, the more interesting part. So I guess the goal in the remaining time is to describe what's going on at a high level. And we basically won't start analyzing until next time, but at least I'll try to plant the seed so that it can soak in a little bit or you can forget it over the course of the next week. Um, but at least that some of the, the algorithmic ideas can soak in and then it will be more prepared. Okay. All right, so let's build some intuition. Okay, so the high level goal is to, um, is to ramp up uh, 
is to ramp up the unsat. Okay, so let's say I have um, a graph CSPG, right? And uh, okay, so what? Uh, let's say for any set of t edges, t constraints from the graph, right? I can build like a mega constraint now over more variables, so this won't be a graph CSP anymore. Okay, where uh, the constraint over those ten edges is the conjunction. So you can only satisfy this mega constraint if you're satisfying each of the ten individual constraints. Okay, so so okay that that uh, that makes it like a two T array or at most two T array CSP. You know you can have at most two T variables in a clause now because you have T clauses and each had T two variables. Okay, so what does unsat of this bigger one become relative to unsat g as a function of unsat g so i'm generating for every possible choice of 10 clauses a mega clause of those 10 clauses replace 10 with t but Multiplies by a factor of t. Why? For all possible pairs of t. So there's going to be m to the t constraints in this bigger problem, right? It's so, okay. Imagine you, you uh, whatever unsat g is, fix a labeling that achieves unsat g, so it has error 10% or something, right? And so if we're going to generate all of them, I'm worrying about it fractionally. I can also think of like generating one uniformly random and saying, okay, what are the odds that that label from unsat g will satisfy this, this random combination of 10, right? So if I pick 10 clauses, and I have 0 0.1 error before. What are the odds that all 10 clauses are satisfied? 0 0.9 to the 10. So 1 minus unsat g to the 10. So it should be maybe 1 minus 1 minus. Uh, let's double check. Uh, right. Okay, so it should be like 1 minus 1 minus unsat g to the t, okay? which is, you know, roughly t on set g, if it, if everything is small, okay? All right, good. And how big does p become? m to the t, right? And I, yeah, I've already said this, but I'll still get out of you. Is, is this a graph CSP anymore? No, right? Because now we have all these these variables. So at some level, so the good part is that the unsat g is is really going up very quickly in proportion to t. But the the bad part is is that it's blowing up in size, and it's not a graph CSP. And we actually want to keep things to be a graph because we have kind of developed this toolkit of all these games we can play with graphs and stuff. We, we understand graphs very well. It makes we can do magic with them. Okay. So the question, and I thought maybe I can poke you guys at ideas before explaining how they do it. What are some ideas to try to do this in a more graphical way? But, you know, similar high level ideas. So I have a graph CSP, I wanna produce another graph CSP and have something similar to the effect of, you know, a uniformly random sample of 10 that I'm combining to ramp up on set G. There's only one graph. Well, if you if you randomly connect the vertex, I mean, it can't be the exact same as. Oh, we yet to still produce a graph. Uh, 
so I guess either no or unspecified, right? I feel like that, yeah, we, certainly what you described doesn't necessarily output a graph or anything particular. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. So, you know, a graphical analog of a random sample, but you're constrained. So in a graph means you're, you're stuck following edges, basically, right? You're constrained to pass. So taking a random walk for 10 steps and gluing everything together might approximate a uniformly random sample of 10, especially if, if the graph is an expander, then actually there is, we can even quantify the difference between a random walk of size 10 and a completely random sample. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. It gets a little bit more complicated because we do wanna generate all the walks, but then we have to figure out the corresponding constraints and stuff. So last time we ended up generating a two T airy, you know, the airiness went up, right? You need it. So we have to address, there'll be more technicalities to address because we have to figure out the corresponding constraints. I'll give you guys a chance to guess that too. Okay, so, so I'm gonna let GT be the graph, that's the teeth graph power. The only thing that we're gonna do differently compared to last time is that I'm roughly gonna do lazy, all lazy random walks, which means each step I can either stay or take an edge, stay or take an edge. Okay, but to keep the proportions right, it should be as if with probability one half you stay and probably one half you take one of the edges. So one way you can do that, remember we have a regular graph at degree D or something, you can add D self loops first and then just do a normal teeth power because the self loop is like pausing there. Okay, so that, that helps for analytical purposes and not too big a deal. Okay, so, but that's just one thing that we are doing differently. Uh, did I erase something here? No. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're doing it with, with lazy random walks. And now, now comes this issue of uh, even if I, have a, a, a lazy random walk at some level. Okay, there's like 10 constraints in the middle, right? And uh, so there should be like 2T or 20 letters participating in this. Whereas I'm used to kind of each vertex just having uh, one letter each, okay? So we're gonna blow up the size of the alphabet, okay? For, for like the stuff to kind of make sense. So how are we gonna blow up the size of the alphabet is okay. So for every vertex, I'm letting kind of n sub t of v be the neighborhood of all the vertices within 10 steps of v, okay, or t steps of v. And, and instead of assigning one letter to a vertex v, okay, uh, I'm gonna be thinking of assigning capital D letter. Okay, so the size of the neighborhood is at most one plus d to the d, t, because okay, there's d choices, d choices, d choices, and it adds up, okay. So I'm just calling that capital D. Okay, so if now in the new graph, instead of assigning one letter to V, I'm gonna assign D letters, okay? And I'm gonna interpret that as one letter for every one of these vertices in the neighborhood. Okay, uh, that's, so that's one way to, so just come up with some consistent thing. Okay, the first one will be V, the next D will be the you know, first D neighbors of V and so forth, but okay. But I'm gonna interpret assigning many letters to a vertex as sort of like locally labeling the neighborhood of V. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Now. Okay. So now for every walk, and I was going to let you guys guess what to do from here. Okay. So, so I have some walk that's going from V1 through VT, consisting of these edges, right? And now I have to make some kind of constraint in this new graph corresponding to this walk. What would be a natural set of rules to do what we want to do? How should I define this constraint corresponding to the walk in the powered graph? Okay, so all these edges should be satisfied. So what does that kind of mean? Yeah, how, let's, let's, let's make that more concrete. Good, so we can look at V0, and V0 in the new one is assigned a ton of letters. But all these vertices are within T steps of V0. So V0 has at some level some idea of what V1 is, V2 is. So, so V0's lettering 
gives a single letter labeling for all of these vertices. And so I can check all the constraints for V0's kind of big labeling. Does that make sense? But it's not just V0. Also VT, it's local, local assignment also gives values to all of these, so we can check all of those as well. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the first thing. Oops. Okay, so I wanna check that, so I'm kind of like thinking, okay, pi bar is the original, I'll put a bar whenever it's the big labeling over the, the, in the power graph, okay? And so this is V0 is sort of like the, lo the labeling that V0 induces on its neighborhood. So I wanted to make sure that satisfies all the edges and same was that local labeling from VT, okay? But there's one more thing we should probably check. Ah, they should agree also on the values of V. They, they shouldn't be allowed to satisfy V1 through VT in different ways, okay? So the other rule we're gonna say is, okay, they have to, they have to agree on their overlap. Okay, so this is a sensible way. It's just syntactically check out even without doing any real quantitative analysis. But I think it, the synth, it, it should pass the compiler check in terms of, oh, this actually makes sense. The letters match the constraints. And it is, it's sort of trying to simulate the idea of independent sampling, but in some graph style of way. Okay, so, okay, so I think that's, okay, so that's, okay, uh, I just had a picture there. So. What we'll, we'll start to try to prove next time then, so I'm just wrapping up, don't worry, is that, is that the unsat of GT should be roughly square root T times the unsat of the original one, unless unsat of G is already bigger than one over T or something. So T is like a constant. So either unsat G is already a constant, we're done, because my goal is just to get a constant, or I'm going up by roughly square root T where T is under my control. So we'll make T big enough so that's like two or something. I mean, there's some small constant in front of square root t, so you have to offset the constant. Okay, so that's what we'll prove next time. And okay, that's a good place to stop. So that describes the construction. And then next time we'll have to actually do some, some heavy math, or not that heavy, but we'll actually have to do some, some calculations and push this thing through. Okay, thanks.